This ESPN podcast is brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit GEICO.com. Before we get started in today's show, I want to tell you about Stamps.com. Longtime sponsor of the BS Report. It's quick. It's convenient. More importantly, it's really, really easy to use. You do not have to go to the post office anymore. You can just stay home. Make your own office, your personal post office. You can avoid lines. You can avoid just standing there as somebody mails some package, some 79-year-old lady. Who needs that? Make your own mailing and shipping from your house. Stamps.com. Put in the top right of the site, BS. You'll get a deal and a scale and a whole bunch of other things. It's a great product. Uh, You can buy and print official U.S. postage using your computer and printer. Stamps.com will give you a digital scale. It will automatically calculate the exact postage for any letter or any package. They'll even help you choose the best class of mail. Wow. Why go to the post office? Just give it to the postman. Stamps.com. Check it out. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. The BS Report. The BS Report with Ben Simmons. We're going to be a support taping this on the Monday before the Emmys. Not sure when it's running. Seth Meyers hosting this year. Yeah. Um, it's on a Monday night. It's on a Monday night for the first time since uh, the mid, the middle 70s. To to avoid preseason football? Like, what's the reason? I there? think VMAs, same weekend. Oh. I think that's the first domino. And then you couldn't push it into September because of regular season football. Oh. Because NBC has Sunday night football. So, so you've done White House dinner... Yeah, you've done. What else have you? You did the SBs. Two SBs. Two SBs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said it was chagrin. No, yeah. I was. Two SBs. Two SBs. Did a uh, one SB and then the other one they talked me into. No, they made me agree to two when I took the first one. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun the first time. The first time was great. You, we got so lucky. Yeah. The first year was LeBron's decision. It was a World oh, Cup yeah. year. Yeah. Um, great summer. Great stuff. And then the next year was just a little flatter. Yeah. Just on the what the news was. Right. That's still where you have that with SNL sometimes. Sometimes there's just you have it with everything. I got incredibly lucky with the correspondence dinner because of, you know, the Donald Trump stuff. Like you just sometimes it falls in your lap a little bit. Right. So yeah. Emmys, it's on NBC. It's on NBC. Mm-hmm. So it rotates through the four networks and basically they choose their own person. So I didn't get chosen among everyone. I sort of got chosen among NBC. Yeah, it's a little strategic. It's strategic. It's a yeah. good thing, though. Absolutely. I'm excited it's about it. It's a great format for you. Yeah, very, very much so. Come out, do monologue. Pop in a couple times. Pop in. Seth, mostly Seth stay out of the things. way. Mostly stay out of the way. I think for me, more than uh, a lot of sort of more talented hosts, or I should say, like just with a, a larger breadth of skills, like for me, it's the monologue. If the monologue doesn't go well, I don't have anywhere to get it back. Right. Yeah. So the last time you were on was before you had a late night show. Yeah. You do basically every week. Every week, yeah. At 12.35 on NBC. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we were exchanging emails about this a couple weeks ago, you said your life is easier now. It's easier than SNL. I think it's easier than being head writer at SNL. I think that job, now I realize how hard that job was. A job I loved, and I'm so happy I did. But How many years did you do it? I think I did that for seven of the 12. So the last, yeah, the last seven. And the nice thing about this job is you come in at 9.30, you tape the show at 6.30, and then when it's done, you kind of just go home. Yeah, uh, because you can get ahead of the writing a little bit more. Right. You know, you're when you're doing stuff like desk pieces that aren't, you know, you don't have to rehearse them a bunch of times. You don't have to camera block them. They can kind of you can kind of get two weeks ahead as far as like what you want to do. And then we always have time in the show for if somebody has an idea that morning, we can squeeze it in as well. So when you were doing SNL, like part of being a head writer, ego juggling. Ego you juggling. Gotta, you have like 13, 10 to 13 kids yeah. plus all the writers. You have like 24 kids. Yeah, I think that was a job I wish I'd done a little bit better at, but I feel like a lot of the egos hit the ground at SNL. Like, no one's really in charge of the egos. It's not, you know, it's mostly just people's feelings. By the way, I don't mean that as a negative thing. It's just like you have all these people, you have basically seven sketch spots and we can update spot and that's it. If you don't make it, you don't make it. And the worst thing is when you see somebody who didn't get on after a really good show at the after party. You know, everybody's in a good mood, and then you realize, oh, not everyone's in a good mood. Right. There's because, never going to be everyone who's happy. Yeah. It's more problem juggling was, I would just like a very small window of time, just, you know, it's all of a sudden it's Friday. The monologue is a mess. There's no, you can't figure out what even to write the cold open about. You know, what is the... What has then maybe nothing in the news that week has the weight to sort of hold that first spot down, and mostly you know, 
just working on a late night show, it just becomes a little bit more disposable. You have you are you can allow yourself to be less precious about it because you get to do it every night. At what point did your sleep habits become normal again? Immediately. You realize the human body wants to have my sleep habit now. Right. Like, oh, this, this is so much back. better. Yeah, yeah. So much oh, better. One o'clock, I'm going to bed. It's the best. I mean, we, my wife and I joke that we're so rarely awake when my show airs. Right. There's no reason for us to be awake at 1235. Right. You know, she has a, a regular job and I try to wake up with her. So yeah, yeah, yeah. the days of, she was always gone by the time I woke up and she was always asleep by the time I got home. So it's a lot better now. So did, once you got away from it, did you realize how insane that schedule is? I like, did. did like, I, oh, why do they do it that way? Yeah. And also because you, you eat weird. Yeah. And you eat at the wrong times and you don't have time to, you know, exercise or be in sunlight or all the things that you're supposed to make you feel better about yourself. Like they just all fall through the cracks. And yeah, I sort of immediately, the other thing that was great that I realized immediately, one, oh, how much healthier I was. And also every week I was gone. It was like a hundred years had passed in SNL time. I would, right. you know, the first week I would see everyone because uh, we're in the same building. And yeah. Oh, we miss you. We know nobody knows oh, what I'm to gonna do. Come back. Yeah. Yeah, be, yeah. And then the next week you realize then you're not even it's not even you're a year out of high school and hanging out. You're like 10 years out of high school and hanging out. And they're like, hey, I went upstairs once to, you know, say hi to Taryn. And everybody saw me in the hallway. It was like, oh, hey, man. Hey, yeah. Hey, How how's it you? going? Yeah. But, you know, they all have their problems at that point and they don't really want to right. see anyone who is in a good mood. Was it weird to watch the show? Yeah, watching it. You had been day. on how many? 11 Twelve years? Twelve and a half. Twelve and a half. half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, crazy weird. Couldn't believe the commercials. I'd completely forgotten from, you know, high school the last time I was watching. I was like, oh, this is yeah. so many commercials. Yeah. And it was just so crazy for the first time in, you know, over a decade to see an SNL sketch start and not know what it was about or where it was going or what the premise was. It was crazy. They broke my rule last season. They had too many cast members. There were there the were history of SNL yeah. says don't have too many cast members. Yeah, it's like basically rule number one. Mm -hmm. And now I think this year they've going to have maybe the right amount of cast members. Yeah, you know, obviously it's a big transition time for the show, and it I you know because I was there at the beginning of last season, and it all made a lot of sense to me as well. Like I certainly wasn't standing there saying this is insane. You just right. It was let's everybody we brought in made us laugh. It made sense. You know, we didn't. I don't think ever. Anyone thought everybody would work out, right. but it did seem like let's let's. So it was like to... you'd like the Patriots when they signed a bunch of D backs and yeah, yeah, third down running backs, exactly. and a couple Somebody... receivers hoping to catch. <laughs> you just unfortunately you just don't have a preseason right. SNL. You don't get to sort of road test any of it until the show starts. I thought it was hilarious that you stayed for the half season. Yeah, looking back, because you you could have easily just been like, you know what, I'm out. But you're like, I can't. I'm not ready yet. I got. 12 more updates in me. I have to do it. I could have had six months. I could have had the last time in my life that I could have had just a sabbatical. Yeah, just kick just back. Just gone. Playing the show, been on an island. Gone to Japan. All yeah. the things that I'll never have time to do now. Yeah, and you gave it away. But I found out about Late Night basically the season finale week the year before. And it just wasn't. It, I think it would have been too intense to make, like find out on Tuesday that Saturday would be my last SNL. So it made a lot of sense to come back. And I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, I had a lot of fun doing an update with Cecily. And, uh, you know, I, I for the, you know, it was great to just, uh, doing the show knowing you were leaving was really fun. Mm -hmm. And knowing you were leaving for something that you were excited about. It was like second semester, senior year. It was very much like that. Taking like a couple of bogus classes. Yeah. And, you know, anytime, you know, you could use, you could, uh, you know, say, I think it's better if you guys write the monologue this week because soon mm. you know i'm not gonna be here and wouldn't be better you know so you kind of like use it as cover so lauren wasn't like well, i think you should maybe stay after season he no no lauren didn't say that what the thing that lauren was saying that was uh very nice was you know you could maybe do both until the end of the season oh mercifully i did not oh, fight on that would have been a bad idea that would have been a bad idea yeah, that would have been a bad <laughs> yeah. idea so when you launched the show who who you knew you were gonna you knew Mike Shoemaker was going to yep. evolve because that's one right. of your best friends in the world. Yeah. You wanted to work together. Absolutely. Who else did you know was coming? Alex Bays, uh, head Weekend writer, writer. Head writer for Weekend Update who had been, you know, we'd worked together for, at that point, seven, eight years. Yeah. Best joke writer um, on earth. Right. And uh, so that was the one person I poached from SNL. And that was the one person that as soon as I got the job, Lauren said, don't take Bays. <laughs> so, but I think everyone... Um, Bays did, and Bays did stick around and do both until the end of the season. Oh no! 
Is he in drug uh, rehab? He's okay now. Okay, good. Okay. Lost a ton of weight, but otherwise he, <laughs> he's good. But uh, those were the only two. Uh, that I knew. And then it was really fun putting together the writing staff. There were a couple guys I knew from Chicago. John Lutz, who was a guy from 30 Rock, who I've known for a really long time. Pete Gross, who is one of my oldest friends. I went to Northwestern with him. Uh, so they were a couple guys we brought in. And then mostly, you know, we put together a staff uh, just based on, you know, we used Twitter a lot. We used uh, UCB improv people we knew, people we bumped into on other projects and kind of put together a pretty good writing staff. How many people did you hire? I think we're at 12. How many people do you have working for you total? Uh, about 70 probably on a show like that. What's it like to be the guy? Uh, getting, takes a lot of getting used to. Yeah. Because, you know, I was probably, you know, there were, there were a handful of us that were, you know, sort of number two to Lauren and that has its, you know, pressures because you sort of have to make sure everything is up to his likings, but you aren't, your name's not on it. Um, so being the guy has been a transition. I think it'll continue to transition. Uh, I still have such love for writers that I... Uh, you're, you're a writer-friendly boss. I'm a writer-friendly boss, and every now and then I'll be out on stage doing something that was written for me that my instinct was this wasn't exactly in my voice, and all of a sudden I'm saying it and thinking, oh, I have to start just saying this isn't in my voice. Right. Because it's all really funny stuff. And that's the other thing when you come from SNL, uh, you know, writing staff doesn't have to write for just one person. So you can have a lot of different, you know, so they're figuring out how to write for me and I'm figuring out how to sort of know what to ask for. Yeah, I told you I wasn't going to send you one email about the show until like the 10 or 11 month mark. Yeah, I appreciate it. Because it takes, it takes a long time. Well, and the other thing is you've all these different people saying, you know, everyone's given suggestions. Everyone feels some sort of ownership of the show mm -hmm. or your future and your, your whatever. And, and I watched it happen with Jimmy, like you have 80 people giving their thoughts and mm -hmm. really what you have to do is just trust the two, three people that you care about and that's it. And trust your own instincts. Yeah. And I'm really lucky that the two, three people I have are people I've known for a long time that I have done me well. I've trusted them a long time, right? I've trusted them for a lot of things. So it's not like we just got thrown into a room and that I liked their credits and they liked what I did. And we sort of are, are putting something together from, the jump, not having known one another. So that's been really good. How many months has it been now? Almost six, 88 shows. All right. So what's changed? I guarantee three things are different. Well, we thought we had a built a thing that we were going to call the newsmakers desk that looked like a weekend update desk. We did it once. We used it once in the first week. So we would roll back the regular desk we have and roll that out. And it would be me uh, doing very close to update features. Yeah. And right away we realized, oh, this is this is too much. Like it's both too much like update, and it's not it distinct fit. enough. It's yeah, not. Yeah. It's sort of neither fish or fowl. Yeah. And also, you know, I do want to use my writing staff on camera, and we're sort of figuring out the best way to do that. But you, the difference, you know, when somebody comes out on Weekend Update to do a feature, they're played by a cast member you've seen before. You know, if Bill comes out. If it's Bill Hader or Kate McKinnon, people are already excited because of who they are. They're playing a character. Yeah. And whereas when you bring out a writer that no one's ever seen before, there's such a higher level of difficulty for them to come out and score because you can tell the audience is asking, wait, is this a guest? Is this one of the people? Is Who is this? And right. So we got away from that um, pretty quickly. Uh, I, we are changing the set. Uh, when we come back after the Emmys, there'll be a different set. So that's something that's changing. I knew that dark, ominous curtain wasn't going to last. No, it's out. It's out. Uh, that's a thing, too, which was it's hard for me because I don't I know from even my time at SNL, I don't have a good visual style. You know, the first set wasn't my idea either. Right. And the second one's not going to be my idea. Uh, but I think it'll have nicer uh, qualities to it. Well, the it's funny you talk. What was the second thing you said about... Um... You had three things. Oh, that was no, that was just two. I haven't come up with. No, it. you it was, had the third one, the, or the second one. The desk. Crap. The I had. Desk. I had, no. It was, it, you reminded me of something that. Happened. Oh, when you're using the writers. Yeah. Um, Jimmy, the first year we did the show, he wanted, and we all thought it was great. Like, oh, the people on the show are part of the family. It'll be right. great. We we'll have them on. They'll be guest hosts. They'll come on until Sal came on and did like this weekly gossip thing about uh -huh. stuff happening. And we, oh, this is gonna. And the reality is a lot of the times you put people, they could be funny behind the things. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not perfect the first time. As you said, the people are like, who is this guy? He's like the lighting director. Why is he on? And, yeah. and you just kind of find out these things by doing them. Yeah. And we're finding, you know, we found different things that are working that, you know, the crazy thing is you do these five test shows, which seems like such a small amount. 
and you learn so much. Right. We learn so much. Thank God we got those five test shows. Yeah. Uh, and again, going back to what we said about SNL, where you don't, you, we actually did get a preseason, which was enough just to do. Uh, really, you should do 20 test shows. Yeah. In a, in a smart world. Point, you, but five is enough to, because again, you don't, you want it to be a little bumpy off the top. Yeah. Because you need somewhere for it to go. And you don't want to be, you know, at the end of the test shows, we didn't think we'd figure it out. We just thought we were a little bit further down the line as far as the best way to approach it. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, and uh, and we'll continue to learn stuff as we go. But Isn't it frustrating that people review the show and they're reviewing the show like it's the finished show? Yeah. I wrote that when I wrote, the, when we launched Grantland, I wrote a whole piece. And it was basically about when we launched Jimmy's show and how different the show was within a year than the show we created and I was like, this is going to happen with Grantland, too. Like, I don't know what the site's going to become, but just can you, you know, yeah. please be patient with us. And, of course, we come out and people are like, this is the site. Mm-hmm. And within a year, like, I mean, I never thought we'd have an electrical closet that turned into a podcast studio. <laughs> right. And you just don't know. Like, things yeah. go up and they move and they go. And and it's not even, you know, again, because, look, I understand the way you review a movie and certainly a television show as well, you know, because by the time the first one airs, they've made a bunch. They've made a bunch. Yeah. You, They have actually, whatever you say about it, they can't change it. Whereas oftentimes, like what I found out after the first night of doing the show, I found out at the exact same time as the people who were watching it. I didn't, I hadn't done it before. Right. Um, and, you know, especially, you know, the worst thing about getting reviewed on the first night, which we knew. The good news was we weren't surprised, just the yeah. way you were with Grantland. You can say all you want. You can't stop it. And so yeah. you just get in the mind space of, but, you know, when people were saying he seemed nervous, which I was absolutely nervous. It would right. have been, I would, I think, would have had him in a sociopath to not have nerves. You weren't nervous. I mean, you probably just had a ton of adrenaline. Yeah, I was I probably a little seemed... tight. Yeah. It's that weird thing where you have too much adrenaline and then you, it in a weird way, makes you still. Yeah. Because that's the thing we're finding out as well is... Um, the difference between telling an update joke and telling a monologue joke. An update joke, there's no room afterwards to sort of fluff around with it. You don't comment back on it. You don't play out the tag. Yep. All things that I feel like the more comfortable you get doing a late night monologue, that's half of the enjoyment for the audience is what you what happens in between the jokes. What was the smartest thing anybody wrote about the show those first few weeks that you read or uh, that you heard somebody wrote? Oh, that's interesting. I don't, I, you know, I, I will say like when I, I skim them more than right. <laughs> just look for, you know, either positive or negative words. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you just want to know the gist. Yeah. Yeah. So there wasn't, I mean, I think there was probably plenty of smart things written about it, but nothing I specifically remember. Mm. Yeah. Um, so you're at month six. Yeah. What's the biggest thing you've learned? Um, the biggest thing I've learned is just that I, for so long at SNL, it was about precision for me in the writing, in the weekend update, whereas these shows are about looseness. I Mm. think that, you know, just giving myself room to, you know, we, because you can obviously tape at 630, you can cut out a monologue joke. It's not ideal, but you don't have the, you have the space to do it. You could just cut it out and. And then when it airs at 1230, that joke's not in. And I'm kind of just realizing that part of the fun is the ones that don't work as well. You know, that's – and then in at Week and Update, if you take out a joke that bombed, I would I always thought, oh, my God, that would have been the best if you could have done that. Then none of them would have bombed. But it's kind of part of the fun, and especially at a late night show. That's a really good skill, and you have it. And I've seen, obviously, many of your shows. And it took Jimmy probably three, four years to realize how to save a bad joke. Yeah. And I don't think people realize how hard of a skill that is because – First of all, if it's in there, odds are somebody thought that joke was working. Right. So there is going to be an element of surprise. As you said earlier, deep down you kind of know with a lot of this. Yeah. But you're still doing it. Like you're yeah. still kind of hoping. Right. So when, when there's nothing there, and Jimmy, the first two years, like he just, you know, he didn't really have a stand-up comic background. So he'd just be rattled and, you know, and then eventually he learned how to use it and mm. turn it into whatever, you know. And I think that's a really hard thing to do. They want to. They want it to work. The audience. Yes. I think sometimes they're surprised when they don't laugh at a joke too. So right. anytime you can sort of bring them into that and discuss it with them <laughs> and make them a part of it, I think that's. What was like two months ago? You had one and it like crossed every line. Oh and yeah. And the audience was horrified. God, and you you loved it. You were like delighted. Oh yeah. I, I, can't, remember I can't remember what, what it was, was but too. you you loved it though. Something about was that maybe about Native Americans? Was that? Yes. Yeah. I can't quite remember the joke, but. 
I do remember there was one. And it was so, I really too felt it was, you know. <laughs> you kind of knew though. You That one you knew, knew there was a chance. And, you know, working on the Emmys, we're going to, there's going to be at least two. You have to go in with two where you, they're, you know they're risky. Well, and then there's always the one that it's somebody who's there, which elicits yeah. a different audience reaction than anything else you're going to get. Especially because they're going to take them. It's not even that people yeah. think about it. They'll take the reaction. Right. You know that. So it's not even, you don't even have to wait to see. They have the camera already waiting on them. Yeah. So they know it's coming. They're like, uh-oh, here, yeah. comes a, here comes a pickaxe flying at my head. Right. But you have a way, when you do it, it feels kind of like you're not mean, which I think is a hard thing. Yeah. Sometimes some some of the people that do it, I mean, most famously Norm at the 98 SPs, which <laughs> right. is one of the five funniest YouTube clips on Absolutely. the planet. But like you have a way of like there's like a little Eddie Haskell-ish. Yeah. Well, I that's a dated reference. It is a really dated reference. God, who's better than Eddie Haskell? Yeah, who's uh, a – I don't know. Who's the new – yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry. But you Sorry, do America. have to – I guess what um, – was it Barney on uh, what's Neil Patrick Harris's character? I feel like that's he's a good mean on on uh, oh, that's good. Not your mother, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, the uh, I try very hard. I do. I don't like telling jokes that are un- vicious. unfair, vicious, yeah. and I also don't like going after people on a night they're being honored. Right. They shouldn't have to get zinged. Yeah, you know they're you know they're already nervous about whether or not they're gonna win or lose. Right. It's enough. It's hard enough to be there. Um, one thing with your show that I think is interesting, Armisen when he's on. Yeah. How many shows is he actually on? Like seventy well, percent? No, it's it's going down just because. I mean, it'll come back up again, but we're it's we're basically in this three four month period where he's really Portlandia based. He's in Portland. I feel like he's Gronkowski. Yeah. Just that when he's on the field, it's up. yeah, it's like a totally it, the ceiling is different. Oh. There might be it might be a fifty point game. It's outstanding. It's he's, when, just, he's such a wild card every second. I'm so excited about the the fact that he's coming back because when right. that show starts and we get to do that thing where we just mess around for two minutes, we're basically you know I ask Fred a question, he has no idea what it is. Yeah, he fully improvises for two minutes. And in a way that I never predict. Yeah. Like he always takes it a different direction than the one I would have, uh, and then the first 10 choices I had. Right. And I basically just get to serve his audience for two minutes. And it's when it's over, I'm in such a good mood. The rest of the show is a breeze. Well, that's one, that's one of your strengths, I think, which we saw an update over and over again, is a weird character and you kind of filling in the blanks. Yeah. Nudging them. It's, uh, like you- I like to try to make sure everyone... I, but yeah, I just try to put in text. You're a nudger. Yeah. Yeah. Comedic <laughs> nudger. Yeah. I like to get, for, yeah. <laughs> but how do we get Gronk on the field? Well, you know, we knew. I feel like Gronk is, yeah. Gronk puts up big stats. It's hard. You know, we, you know, again, we came to Fred so late as an idea. Right. And the one downside to it was we knew Fred had these other commitments. Mm. And so and we do want our show to be a place where, you know, even when writers have, you know, if a writer gets asked to do just for laughs in Montreal. We want to be a show where we let them go for a week. We don't want to get in the way of everybody's, you know, if they have other things they're excited about. And Fred's obviously the biggest example of that, but we couldn't, you know, the thing is we could find someone who was available all 12 months, but they're not going to be Fred Armisen. So I'd rather have my, you know, then you're ending up with like Ben Watson. Exactly. You can't, or like, yeah, uh, Kellen Winslow. <laughs> Kellen ben Winslow, Winslow And you think, well, two of them, they would add up yeah. to one Gronk. When you look at their stats. By the way, Belichick's probably going to do that next year. Yeah, I bet. Hey, well, Gronkowski's <laughs> going to play all the time. So I got this guy and that guy. These three guys. They're like, oh, well, that's not, not totally Gronk. Um, with your show, one thing you did that was different. You don't have a lot of music. Well, we have two a week, sometimes three. But most, but you like that last act sometimes to not be a musical guest. We do. I mean, is, the other thing you use it for are things I like, which is uh, comedy, stand up yeah. comedy. Uh, you know, authors. Also, sometimes that's a slot. Like for, Grantland's Jonah Carey. Yeah. Jonah Carey. Yeah. Uh, Men and Blazers were Men and were Blazers on there. were great. Uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, uh, that those kind of guests are really fun for me. And, you want to be a show that has those kind of guests on, you know, Derek Waters from drunk history. Like he came on and, and sort of in that comedy spot and was really fun to talk to. And I, I think those are great guests. And for me, you know, I do, when music comes on, I feel like I'm cheating because I don't do anything for the last right. act of my show. 
And my with thing with a, the music is, I I do feel like so many of those shows do it, and I can get that music on YouTube. Yeah, like you should be trying to create a different corner. That's what we're doing. And yeah. the nice thing about music is we're really good, really good music booker. And he goes out of his way to try to find bands that are doing their first uh, TV appearance. You know, so sometimes it's people who are, you know, more iconic that you, you know, you have Counting Crows on, which is a band I really yeah. liked and like. Um, but then other times we have people that I've never heard of. Then, you know, you realize it's a big deal to their fans that they're on TV for the first time. So, you know, I think part of the job of having the 1230 show is you're going to have a lot of people who are doing talk shows for the first time. And that's really exciting. You know, when my first talk show was Conan and I want this to be a place where everybody kind of you have a lot of firsts. Right. Who's the what guest have you had on the most? Uh, nobody's on been on more than twice. Um, Brian Williams. Because I, I thought you were gonna. What I expected was I thought you were gonna have like seven or eight regulars, kind of yeah. like what Letterman did in the eighties. But it seems like you're just grabbing everybody. I mean, I think we'll. I think regulars will develop. I do think someone like I like Men in Blazers. I'd love to have them on. Millar and Casey. Outstanding. They've been on twice. Yeah. I kind of want them to be our baseball guys. Yeah. You know, they're just great. They're good together, too. Really funny. Yeah. And I think that'll sort of uh, develop uh, who our people are. But, you know, that's the thing. Six months in, there's there been so many people we've had on that the minute they leave, we're like, we have to have them back. They were great. They were outstanding. So. I do that with my podcast. So I'm like, you're going to be at it, and then I forget, or yeah. like, whatever, you lose, <laughs> lose an email. Or <laughs> right. Well, one thing that we didn't talk about, you're in a great spot, because you you get this show. You're going to follow Fallon. Yeah. Cool. Fallon's taking over. He'll do fine. And then the show becomes a f***ing juggernaut. It's a monster. I'm going to swear. I'm sorry. It's a monster. It's a monster. It really is. In the Did anyone see that coming? I mean, I think everyone at NBC was really excited about it. And I was really excited about it. Did you it. think it was going to do that? I am so... I don't think... I would be crazy for me to say I thought it was going to do that. Um, I thought it would be this good. I didn't quite understand how massive it would be. There's never been a better time to be in the 1230 slot. Ever. Ever. Yeah. Than right now. And we're just such a beneficiary of it at our show. And it's great. I mean, the whole, you know, again, especially, you know, NBC, Tonight Show and Late Night has been so fraught over the years. Uh, I think everyone's kind of like pinching themselves how smoothly this one has gone up to this point. Do you feel like, I mean, we've we've probably talked about this before, but the Late Night, just the way the whole model I feel like whatever Fallon, the success he's had, I don't know what the model is anymore. Because, like, he'll bring a guest on, these celebrities will come on, and they'll, like, throw a football through a window. Yeah. And it, it's, for whatever reason, it's kind of captivating. It's and totally the captivating. Are, the celebrities are totally at ease. They yeah. They love coming on. It's well, like they're going, coming to a birthday party. Well, there are times where you just also realize there are a hundred different kinds of talk show guests. Yes. And you can tell... A minute into it, not even 30 seconds into talking to them, you realize what kind of guests they are. And as the host, you then try your best to get the best version of them out. Well, sometimes they'll be nervous too, right? And yeah. Gotta, like, and that's that the thing that I'm so jealous of, you know, my professional jealousy for what Jimmy has figured out is you, there's no show, there's no talk show where you see people being comfortable more than right. it is. And at the end of the day, I do really think an audience wants to. At that hour of night, they want to watch people have fun and be comfortable. And he just gets the best out of people. Yeah. I, In a way that's really hard sometimes. Sometimes when you're, um, you know, I, you know, and again, I haven't been doing it that long. But there are times where you do feel like the burden you feel is, oh, I'm not getting the best out of this person. I, I'm trying to help them and I can't quite figure out how. Right. I, uh, I, yeah, I don't, they, whatever's happening with late night, it hasn't totally played out yet. But it does seem like the viral videos mm -hmm. have become way – I mean, I, I just like – I can't imagine 20 years ago us ever thinking that you'd be watching a late night show and as you're watching it going, oh, that's going to end up online tomorrow. Like right. just the mindset of even watching the show feels different. Although if we if it had existed, you would have been so excited to – if you were oh, watching yeah. Letterman going, you would have been so excited to go to school and know you could pull it up on your phone and show it to everybody. It's, it came and went on Letterman, unless yeah. you taped it on, on like a VHS tape. We are, I mean, we are not a very viral show thus far. Uh, you're not. We, and then part of it is. I would you know, say you're more of an old school show. I think we're more old school. I mean, I, it's also, it's a little out of my skill set. We don't, he, again, we follow a show that does it so well. Right. And you try so hard. I mean, one of the things we need to, to constantly try is there's so many things that 
we would just look like a pale imitation. So you just you which run is, as far away from those. Worse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for us, it'll be interesting because I do think it's it, that is a thing we kind of need to crack of like, how do we do viral without, you know, looking like In a, a lesser version of of both Fallon and Kimmel, who I think do it very well. Well, your monologue is a lot different than Fallon's. Yeah. Um, the interviews are totally different. Mm-hmm. Do you use notes when you do those or do you I have use notes, the cards? I have cards, but I don't look at them during the interview. Because I was going to say, I don't think you do. Obviously, I don't yeah. have notes. You're, you're very good at this. Well, I, well no, I just, yeah. I, I'd rather just figure it out in the fly. And like, I usually go into it with like the 10 things I want to hit and just yeah. keep them in my head. They, you know, my segment producer comes out before, during the commercial break. They hand me the cards. I read through them. You know, we've talked about it already, so it, that's just... So a, you know they're going to hit the one or two stories? Yeah, I kind of look through it, and, and in my head, I try to order it the way I, I think it'll flow the best. And then, yeah, then I don't like looking at them. I like, you know, I think it's nice to maintain eye contact through interviews. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that's a, a, a gets better out of people. Do you follow, like, a script, or do you just say, like, I'm journeying around, but I know I have to hit this one thing? Yeah, it's interesting. Like sometimes when you have comedians, like right. they have really funny things. Yeah. And you to for them you do want it your job is to just be a setter. You're just setting them up, setting them up, setting them up. Whereas with other people, you know, with an actor who's maybe they're promoting a movie, then if they say something about it that you hadn't thought of, then you can just sort of follow that because it's not really important to them what it is they talk about. Mm. They're you know, some people you just sell right away are natural um uh, conversationalists and it doesn't matter you if, if at the end of the time you don't hit the talking points they're not going to be upset about it how much sports have you brought in it seems like you've kind of journeyed around to the things you like a little bit yeah for football season will be interesting right yeah i think you know we've uh we've had eyes on we're having bit map area on matthew barry a little fantasy a little fantasy uh you know i it is interesting athletes are fun but like color guys are great for me. Like the men and blazers who are watching everything. Yeah. Whereas, you know, when you have an athlete on, a current athlete, you know, once they, they have to be a little political about what they talk about and who they talk about. Yeah. You know, two, they really can only share their experience. Whereas I feel like when you're dealing with people who are watching everything, they're so funny because they can sort of give you a primer on everything that's happened so far in the season or, or the sport they cover. Who is the best sports person you had? So somebody I should have in my podcast? Millar and Casey? Millar and Casey, I would have in a heart. I've had both of them separately, but never together. They're so funny. It's They're tough so to do a three-man man pod. Yeah, I believe They'd that. have to be in person. Yeah. You would have to do in person. Yeah. But the I guy, do. they are both, every time, I'm, they've on, been on twice, our same producer comes in after talking to him, and he's always crying, because he's just, they make him laugh so hard. How are you feeling about the Steelers? Uh, I'm always a little optimistic, but I feel good. <laughs> I was driving... Um, somewhere to get coffee or something. I was listening to the Mike Lupica show on mm-hmm. Sunday. It's some, it's I guess it's on sometime Sunday morning. Some guy called me. He's like, "I'll tell you who's gonna win the Super Bowl, Mike. The Pittsburgh Steelers. Tomlin's due." Blah, blah, blah. He laid out this yeah. whole thing. Lupica just shot him down and hung up on him. That's great. And I was like, "Oh, this is good for the Steelers. Low expectations." I got. I paid the whatever twenty dollars to get the preseason app. So I can mm. watch. So I've watched their preseason games. Yeah. They seem a little faster on defense. And Roethlisberger is really an excellent quarterback. He And he's got a little uh, chip on his shoulder he's this year. He's got a year. chip on his shoulder. Not and only he, the contract, but then Emmanuel Sanders. Calling him out. Lobs some leader darts at him. Which is bad for him. And you well, just. a little bad for him. When you watch those games, is when you watch the other games, which I, when you watch every snap, like I have, he just, he's played behind some really terrible offensive line. Terrible. Which is just unfair yeah. when they're judged. It's it, it's like run support with pitchers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's a thing you just can't control to some degree. So, yeah. And they look the line looks better. So I'm excited. I can't wait. Mostly, I've been so stressed out about the Emmys. I'm so happy that when it ends, football season starting. Then you have this carrot. I've and... just been like picturing September for so long. So why are you stressed out about the Emmys? I just get stressed out about things. Oh, it's not. Yeah, I think it's just like, hanging over your head like yeah, a turn paper. We're prepared. We've. I feel like with the things we have ready to go are the right things. So I'm not thinking, oh, I wish I could go back a month. It's not even that. I just want to go forward a week. And Neil Brennan hasn't given you his one great joke yet. But Neil Brennan it's has not. It's, it's coming. It's coming. So you have that. Yeah. Then you have a couple other ones. And Brennan's good because Brennan is the kind of guy who he'll come to a joke read and he'll come to rehearsal and he'll just, he's like one of those people who you trust so much. He'll go, yeah, it's good. You're good. And then you just, then you he's know. very zen. It's been vetted. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then he doesn't, then he has no patience for you being stressed out. Yeah. And you're like, I just think he's like, eh. and then you're fine. Have you had more or less time to follow sports since you started this show? More. Yeah. More. It sounds like your life is just better now. My life's better now. My life's better. I get in the car at the end of work and I, well, you know, I put on the MLB app and just do like, as I drive home, I listen to baseball and it's great. Who do you miss most from SNL? Um, who do I miss most from SNL? I mean, so many people that I miss the most have left, had left ahead of me. Right. That's true. So um, you were slowly missing them anyway. I was slowly missing them anyway. I mean, you know, I still see him, but Colin Jost was one of my closest friends on that show. And, uh, you know, it's it, just finding time to still hang out with him. And, and, you know, it's, it's very strange when, cause this, you know, over the course of the summer, you know, we're in the same building as the tonight show, but we're a floor above them and we actually never see them. Mm. It's very rare for me to run into Jimmy anywhere. Yeah. Whereas SNL is on the same floor. So when we were, when we started our show in February, we basically shared the floor for that first three months. And now they've been gone for the summer. It'll be crazy when they come back in September, because then it will remind me that I work at the same place I've always worked. I saw some story that he was saying that maybe like a week or two ago, he was like, yeah, I know I wasn't good on Weekend Update, but I'm going to be better this year. It was like, so <laughs> yeah. it was interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think all of us who ever had that job, it's so hard in the beginning to figure out just what to do. Also, you know, for somebody like Colin, who's both a really good writer and a really good stand-up, that's a job. Weekend Update is a job about stillness. Yes. You, you know, can't like, have any ticks at all. Yeah. So, uh, but then, you know, and then there's that difference between stillness and stiffness and what that means. And, but I thought he was uh, better every show. It's funny because I'm working on this big thing about SNL sketches right now. And Yahoo has all of them. I yeah. know it's the second worst search engine on the internet behind the SI Vault, which and then is the worst prompt. search engine ever. Oh, yeah. The SI Vault. The SI Vault, which guy, guy who changed the SI Vault, if you're listening, worst move, I think, in the history of the internet. It is a debacle. Like, you literally can't find anything now. It used to be a good site. But at the Yahoo thing, it's so hard to find stuff. Really bad. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, is when it has music. It it's, it's just it out. Live. Yeah. So I saw some update from early. When yeah. you start, when did you take over? Like, oh, six? Seven, I think. Oh, seven, something think like that? Seven, yeah. And it was funny, like, because I thought you were good right away in that show. But then as it progressed, yeah. like... You could see like you're a little more fidgety and you're, yeah. you know, it's like, it takes a while. It takes a while. Yeah. And, and as you said, stillness and milking, what like there's just yeah. little things. Well, I think actually Jost has been really good at that. And I think his the style, stillness. yeah, is stillness in the milking. And I think his, because he's both a really playful writer, but he also is like, has no fear of what crosses the line. Right. And I, I think, think in time, people will really come to enjoy that from him. Yeah. Yeah. He, Tough to follow you during a season. Yeah. I don't know, know if that in retrospect was great for him. It was, it was probably better for me than that I got, just that I got right. to have my It would be uh, like farewell. if Tom Brady left this past season in week eight. And I told said, you in week Jimmy one. Jimmy Garoppolo here. Yeah. Told you in week Take one. Take over, week nine. Good <laughs> luck. Um, <laughs> Take it. But yeah, the, uh, you know, again, because uh, I, you know, I followed Tina Fey, which was no easy task either, but I did have the, there was a whole summer. Where no one was to doing about it, yeah. right? So I do think that, uh, you know, and I did it for a really long time. So I, it was not uh, an easy time for him to step in, but I thought he did great. It's kind of incredible how long forty years is. It's insane. and you just think like going through all these sketches and just how they pass through different parts of my life, but then seeing all the different update hosts and like that first Norm season when the show wasn't good and he was so. Just, I mean, nobody really even knew who he was, and he yeah. just came out and was just firing bombs. And yeah, but you just watch all the different incarnations of it, and there's been some really bad ones and some really good ones. And they had a couple of years where they didn't even care about it. Like in '84, I didn't even think they had a weekend update host. Yeah, they called it something different as well. Yeah. They don't even count. They kind of gave they up on it. Count that sort of three year era as not being weekend update host. Yeah, like Brad Hall was in there, yep. and it just never. Then Brian Doyle Murray, and then nobody. And yep. It's, the host would sometimes jump in. Fernando yeah. hosted it once. <laughs> and then Dennis Miller came in, and then he was really the only bright spot of that whole year other than Lovitz. He, you, Dennis Miller saved. We Resuscitated it. it. Yeah, he really did. And he made his own. And those are hilarious ones to watch just because of the style of Dennis's. He's so loose. Right. It's almost the camera isn't even on no. a tripod sometimes, yeah. it feels. And he's, you know, he's not. It's pre when it was blue blazer and red tie. Like he's, you know, different wearing different colored ties, like pattern ties. And, right. 
I feel like his his update influenced yours, which I didn't realize till after the way he played off. Yeah, he was the first one who. All right, there's a character on, and Miller's going to play off this character, and that's going to be part of the bigger thing. Yeah, before it was just a guy would come on, do their thing, go back to. Yeah, you know what I mean. And it was fun. That was you know again. You know, because you never were responsible for the laughs during those. You were just responsible for getting the ball. The nudging. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so those were so much fun to do. Yeah. And uh, do you ever go through the Yahoo? Look up stuff? A lot I of what's on there. Have. I was just recently trying and then I realized it was music. So I had to find it on some weird Japanese website. But Forte's, uh, my wife had never seen Forte's Peyton Manning halftime thing where he does the weird dance. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not on there. No, yeah, nothing not with on. music yeah. is on there, which is super That must make your searching really hard. Really hard. Yeah. Really hard. And there's less resource material yeah. than I expected. That was the thing as head writer, you always had to remind people, if you use this song, it, it will disappear. Well, the four dudes singing in a bar, yeah. no record of any of those. No. Yeah. Um, Ebony and, and Ivory with Stevie Wonder and yep. as Eddie, Eddie is Stevie mm-hmm. and go, not there. Like any music, anything is What about there. Cowbell? Does Cowbell live? Did they clear they, I think they cleared that when they yeah. did it. Yeah. Which was interesting. But um, yeah, I mean, they, and then if stuff crossed the line, it just doesn't make it. Right. Like Heather Lackler had a great sketch like 20 years ago. It was an infomercial. I don't know if you remember. And it's like, it's so easy to use. Well, anyone who's telling you blah, blah, blah is lying, like the Holocaust. And and the right. audience goes, oh, and and it's just, and the phones start ringing. And it's like, so that's not on there. And I guess they, because it must have been, they yeah. must have thought it was super offensive. At the time, it was, you know, one of the best sketches of that season. But I think they just kind of have decided retroactively what is now mm-hmm. more offensive in our social It's weird media because era. I don't know who's making those calls. It seems to me that, the Yahoo buying the SNL library, it would just all sort of end up there. Because I, I don't thought. feel like there's anyone actually at the sort of... Well, what's weird is Uncle Roy is on there, which was the single most yeah. offensive sketch they've ever done. The but Child also, Molesting Babysitter. All three of those are on Yahoo yeah. for some reason. And I, to me, that's probably number one. It's insane that if that aired now, I mean, it couldn't. I feel like the internet would actually, it would yeah. just, the internet would collapse on itself. Mm-hmm. And then we'd eventually emerge from the shrapnel like two days later as people came to grips with what just happened. <laughs> it's right, it's on there. You Google, go yeah. on Yahoo and Google Uncle Roy. What was the all-time line cross sketch for you um, that you felt like? For me personally? No, I mean for the, when you were on the, the show. Era? Yeah. I'm trying to think we've got the most heat over. Because Parnell, before you got there, Parnell did the Mercury Mistress. Yeah, that one. That they've only aired it. once. Well, that Mercury pulled the plug on that oh that's actually- yeah because they used an actual mercury and so basically they got a phone call <laughs> that actually might have been the number one line cross that was great it was a car you could you could have sex with, with. Yeah. and chris Parnell did the perfect the, the perfect cast member <laughs> he really was uh I'm trying to think of what we got the most heat for we did one. um uh yeah you know every now and then you know you'd get angry letters about stuff but nothing that felt you know, we tried really hard not to have one that Go would too blow far. up the internet. Yeah. It was interesting. This last season, um, the writer who came on, who did the whole bit about... Leslie Jones. Yeah. Slavery. And that was like a huge backlash for that. I will say I was surprised. She, you know, she's... Leslie's so funny. She auditioned with that piece. Yeah. Um, she's going to come on my show soon. I think she's just so uh, wildly funny. And it's, you know, so from her voice. It's so who she is. And... Uh, I guess I shouldn't, you know, we do live in an era of outrage, but I, I, you know, I thought that was a really, you know, again, being a fan of Leslie Jones, I thought that was a great Leslie Jones piece, but well, she they, had to take a lot of heat for it. Well, you face this with SNL and you're facing it with your show now. I mean, every, there's this whole Twitter performance art section. Yeah. That just goes nuts about everything. Yeah. Partly as performance and just the way the internet works now. People get outraged about something and they get their 20 four to 30 hours out of it and they move on to the next yeah. thing. It's really bad for comedy. Oh, it's I think, terrible. I think part of comedy is you don't know where the lines are until you get near the line a couple of times mm-hmm. and you're going to go over it once or twice. It yeah. doesn't mean you're the worst person in the world. It's just what comedians do is they try to see where the lines are and it's a constant struggle to push it. Also, you know, when, when the line gets crossed, people, over-focus on the piece that crossed the line as opposed to the body of work 
that, you know, yes. and, and because I feel like there's more clues uh, as to the pattern of what's going to happen in the future in the whole body of the work as opposed to that one piece. I think always people always think when something crosses the line that it is um, it will now only be this. Right. So it's only going to be this terrible offensiveness. Uh, we, you know, batten down the hatches because it's all changing. Whereas, you know, the reality is over the course of, of, you know, not just SNL's 40 years, but the last 40 years, you know, people cross it and they come back and they figure it out. And, um, you know, part of, I think the thrill of watching comedy in general is wondering if the line will get crossed and, you know, not knowing until afterwards if it did, or if when you actually, when something offensive was said, you kind of are like, you know what? I was actually okay with it yeah. because of the way it was framed. So. Well, and as we talked about before, that's you got all these grizzled comedy writers in a room, and that's the only way you're going to make each other laugh sometimes. Right. Is is to cross the line, and that's what becomes funny is that somebody said something horrible. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're not going to laugh at all for three hours. We, you know, we do have to remind people all the time that the comedy writer laugh is a different laugh. You know, again, there's, you know, the perfect one is the joke that makes everybody laugh, comedy writers included. But you don't want right. to do the, just the comedy writing because it, it's a deafening silence when you do it for. It's an, I'm imagining the SNL room is the all time most intimidating room. I, when I was googling something, I was looking for a hater sketch, and uh, there was something some hater interview about his first time he ever pitched a sketch on SNL, and he was all fired up. I forget what the sketch was. He was all fired up about it, and it was just crickets the entire time, and he was just like he felt like his whole world was collapsing. Yeah. But that's just the way it goes. Yeah. I mean, that SNL pitch is a weird room to begin with. And sometimes because of the host, it gets, it's competitive. And then sometimes like the host is great and the room just gets hot early. And sometimes mm -hmm. it just ices. And But especially when people are brand new, uh, that's that weird thing. It's kind of the first time you're hearing them perform in front of everybody. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, then ultimately – because bombing at pitch is in a strange way harder than bombing at the table. Because when you bomb a pitch, it's you really only had, you just had to get through 15 seconds without bombing. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, you certainly learn. You know, whenever I see old SNL people and they talk about like a table read they were at for a movie or a table read for a you know a, a sitcom reading or anything, we always talk about the differences between LA audiences. You know, when you're in a, mm. you know, when you go to a, uh, you know, I've been to a lot of screenplay readings where stuff just kills. And you, there's too much stuff at SNL for stuff to kill. People can't fake laugh over the course of four hours of sketches. Like, if it's not funny, people just don't laugh. So you really, it is the truest read. Um, Norm MacDonald once said, which I thought was, it's like the last place you can really bomb SNL. You can just bomb. Right. You can do a sketch and no one will laugh. There's no warm-up comedian who comes out between commercials and reminds everybody that this is a comedy show. It just comes up, you know, commercial ends and it just comes up on this sort of four to five minute piece of comedy and and it can just be ice cold well when you so you when you had those snl pitches it was you you're listening but lauren's listening and yeah. a couple of the other producers now you're doing your show yeah your opinion really ultimately is yes it's a it's a one-man democracy it's a one man so is there a different pressure for the fake laughing or no i we kind of when we do pitches we do it we'll do it after a show one night we'll all go in a room and we go huh. around sort of like three times and uh the best thing we've learned is just uh, whatever good or bad i think um sometimes you want to talk it out a little bit more but mostly it's just great great and just move on and then afterwards i can go through it and right. sort of realize what i like, like and don't that like. One, that one, yeah that one. and that way stuff just sort of uh there's not a moment where you have to say uh no do you feel like people write stuff because i guarantee this didn't happen at sno but it happens for you People are writing stuff specifically to make you laugh or things that they know you like. Yeah. Which I, I remember at Jimmy's show that used to happen. People would steer stuff right toward his wheelhouse and be like, all right. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I, they probably are. Yeah. Meanwhile, we all, our ego is such that I, whatever I like, I think is what everybody should yeah, like. Yeah. No, I think they're writing for everyone. Yeah, it's yeah. a universal, they have a universal skill. <laughs> More Pittsburgh Steeler jokes, please. Yeah. Well, that, of course, is the worst thing is when they write what they think you'll like. But, of course, they know what you like so much less than you that right. it's, you know, it's like a girlfriend buying you a gift. I got you like uh, I got you a Steelers football card. Mm. Like, oh, yeah. That's how many years has to pass from the Justin Bieber SNL episode before we can talk about it? Oh, I feel like it's probably getting closer. We're not quite there yet. I Here's what the good news is. The worst the worst people behave after they host Makes you feel better it, about telling the Yeah, it closes stories. the gap until when. 
Are we within a year? I think we're within a year. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, I think we're within a year. Um, cause, because there is that thing of... It's, so, it's like the mafia. You, you have yeah, to bury family secrets. Because you want people to be feel comfortable to come and do it. Like it's, it's the high, Again, it's the highest risk you can do as a uh, guest on that show. But it's, when somebody is a historically annoying celebrity who's yeah. also – this is part of 130 terrible stories about him. Right. At some point, it becomes easy. Yeah. You want to give – how old is he now? I think he might be almost 21. Yeah. I mean, I guess you want to give him at least 21 and see if they'll turn it around. You know, because that is the weird thing about – again, I wouldn't want people to talk about something I did when I was 19. It depends It depends what it was. Yeah. That's true. If you manage to turn a 200-person show against you, I mean, that might be – Which, again, I'm, I'm neither confirming nor denying. I know. We'll have to wait a year. You know, wait. There was a great quote. I think Bill Murray said this in, in the SNL book, one of the SNL books about – when you become famous, you have a year or two where you're going to act like an asshole. Mm-hmm. And after that, if it doesn't change, it becomes permanent. And he said that about Chevy Chase, which right. I thought was interesting. Um, but I think that's a good quote from Mr. Bieber to maybe take heed of. The one uh, that the I... The two years might have passed. Yeah. The one that I heard, which I think maybe was from Shoemaker first, if uh, famous people who were assholes were probably assholes when they weren't famous. That, that's interesting. Yeah. Which I also think. I think there's a lot of truth to that. That's interesting. Yeah. So it was always there. It was latent. It was just yeah. Looking. It just celebrity gives you an excuse to use it. Like it takes out all the checks. Mm. I still feel like if anything happens to you that's awesome before you turn like 28, it's dangerous. Yeah. Again, I I was lucky. I mean, I was 27 when I started on the show, so I was. I mean, right. I all my. My best friends are still my best friends. Like there was no, yeah. I didn't, I, I wasn't young enough that I could just move on right. to a new group of people. And it wasn't like, it wasn't like when Eddie Murphy was a superstar when he was 20 and right. Elvis outfits after yeah. second year. Also, I wasn't, it's also very, like I wasn't a superstar at 27 either. Right. Like I took me seven took years on seven the years show. To get, so uh, by the time that I had any, that I could have sort of thrown my wait around, dickhead yeah. elbows around, I was in my mid thirties. I was, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, Emmys Monday night, NBC. Emmys Monday. Congratulations eight o'clock. on winning yours. I'm really, Thank you. I'm really happy for you. Thank you. I That's appreciate great. it. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, eight o'clock on a Monday. And then your show. Um, are you on hiatus for two weeks or one week? Yeah, this week and next week. So then we come back and uh, with a new set. Sounds a little exciting, right? I'm, I'm almost due for my first guest appearance. Yeah. When just do you need to figure it out? Yeah, it was I'm ready. It, it, we, I guess maybe we'll. I'm ready. Maybe yeah. closer to basketball or I something. I think closer to basketball. Whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to do. But I can't wait. You can be my, I don't have any basketball guys yet. Oh, can I be your basketball guy? I'd love it. You can come out on your own. You can That'd be, be Jalen. You can do whatever you want. Oh, but you'd love Jalen. See, I'm always afraid to share Jalen with others. Yeah, don't share him. You can just come on. <laughs> <laughs> Seth Myers, good luck. Talk Thanks. to you soon. All right. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. Geico presents Strange Saving Stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance.